Inflation is running hot in the U.S. and up here in Canada, we are seeing bond yields pushing higher and higher. Basically, any chance of rate cuts diminished even further this week. And meanwhile, employment numbers are increasing quite notably and Canada's immigration rate is about to decrease quite notably. So how are all these landscape changes going to affect prices and uh, the real estate market here in Vancouver? Well, we're going to discuss all those things in this episode, as well as a look into what's happening in the Toronto market and what the heck is happening in Calgary that is pushing prices higher and higher and hitting new all time record prices. Well, right off the top, let's talk about it. The rate announcement that just happened this week from the Bank of Canada. I'm sure you've heard about it by now, but obviously they held at the 5% overnight rate. This is their sixth hold in a row and rates have now been 5% dating back to July, nine months. And 5% is going to remain there until at least June the 5th, which is their next announcement, making it 11 months in a row at that rate. We're almost at a full year at 5%. Now, the bank noted that while the Canadian economy appears to have entered a phase of excess supply, they noted that it expects growth in the Canadian economy to pick up this year and next. The BOC also cited that inflation is still too high and that risks remain and that shelter inflation is still very elevated. No surprise there. Anybody with a mortgage or anyone paying rent knows that shelter is definitely inflated. The financial markets believe that this was the last hold though before the BOC begins embarking on what they call a series of rate cuts starting in June. But ultimately, we've been hearing this story going back to about late 2023, right? Do you remember when the cuts were expected as early as January, February? Well, now we're out to June. And when June happens, what's going to happen then? Well, we'll find out obviously, but you know, there's still mounting evidence, of course, of further economic stresses here in Canada. We saw the jobs data come out in March that showed Canadian unemployment rate. It reached its highest level in three years. There's also evidence of strengths though, right? Which side is going to win here? Uh, but these strengths we definitely see in the US of A, where the US economy has again proven stronger than anticipated, buoyed by resilient consumption and robust business and government spending. Ryan will dive more into that with their inflation announcement. And what else is affecting these uh, rate decisions here? Of course, sticky inflation and the rising inflation that we just saw in the States. So who wins? Is it going to go up? Is it going to go down? Or maybe the rate just stays flat. We touched on that concept a couple months ago, but realistically is 5% or the 5% range what Canadians should prepare for, for years to come? Maybe, you know, and uh, at least well into 2025, when the Bank of Canada expects inflation to hit 2%. So will they even consider lowering rates before they hit that 2%? I mean, that's kind of been the crying call for some time now. But they're saying today that that 2% rate won't be hit until maybe mid 2025. That's another year of 5% rates. That's almost two years in a row of 5% rates. Well, with each passing day and each new data point that presents itself, new guesses are coming in as to where rates are going to go next. Interestingly, the British Columbia Real Estate Association stated that they expect the bank will lower rates three to four times this year in 25 basis point increments with 2.5% as the ultimate destination for the overnight rate by the end of 2025. Okay, that's one uh, guess, <laughs> one sort of uh, throwing their hat in the ring uh, opinion. Now, the rate hold on Wednesday, it did of course send bond yields upwards. And at the time of recording, it was up 14% or sorry, 14 bips on the day. And I mean, this five-year bond is up 18% year to date, not a small number. This is ultimately going to, of course, push fixed rates even higher and make things harder for the Bank of Canada to cut at its next announcement on June the 5th. But you know what? That's still two months away and a lot can happen between now and then, especially when it comes to inflation announcements and sometimes the surprises they're in. Speaking to surprises, let's take a look at the U.S. inflation because it was a rather large surprise for everybody. Uh, U.S. consumer prices increased more than expected in March. So Americans continue to pay more for gasoline, rental housing, and leading financial markets to anticipate that the Federal Reserve may delay cutting interest rates until September now. 
The third straight month of strong consumer price readings reported by the Labor Department on Wednesday also suggested that the pickup in inflation in January and February could not solely now be attributed to businesses raising their prices at the start of the year, as many economists had argued. The report followed news last week that job growth had accelerated in March, with the unemployment rate slipping from 3.8% to 3.9% in February. Still, there's some silver linings here. <laughs> Food prices at the supermarket but the supermarket were unchanged and the cost of motor vehicles is declining, leading to some return of some deflationary pressure amongst goods. The consumer price index rose at 0.4% last month after advancing by the same margin in February. Gasoline prices climbed 1.7% after increasing 3.8% in February. So there's a little bit of good news there. Shelter costs, which include rents, rose 0.4%, the same as February. And economists polled by Reuters had forecasted the CPI gain of 0.3% on the month and advancing 3.4% on the year. Though the annual increase in consumer prices has declined from a peak of a staggering 9.1% in June 2022, the deflationary trend that we've become accustomed to over the last year and a half has virtually stalled out, especially in the recent months. And President Joe Biden he, he's come out and said, uh, well, obviously a number of things, but in particular, he urged corporations, including grocery retailers, to use their record profits to reduce their prices. Yeah, we'll see that. I'm sure we'll see that happen. Biden also said that he had a plan to lower housing costs by building and renovating more than 2 million homes. Dan, that sounds really familiar. I feel like we've heard that before somewhere. Uh, and a bit of a sidebar to that, if the US, the US Fed, the biggest economy in the world thinks it can build and renovate 2 million homes, how the hell do the liberals believe they could build 4 million homes when we don't, when we don't nearly have the level of output that the US has? Shortly after the data, financial markets pushed back their expectations for the first rate cut to September from June. Now expect, you know, instead of three rate cuts down in the States, it's looking more like two. And that's even if we get there. There's a growing minority of economists who see the window for rate cuts actually closing altogether. Stocks on Wall Street tumbled as the US dollar rallied significantly against uh, a ton of different currencies around the world. And the market's probability of a June rate cut sank to 21% down from 53% on Tuesday and 73% last month. This is crazy. It's becoming clearer and clearer that the stubbornly high cost of living looms large over the future presidential election here. I think one of the questions that central banks are asking themselves is, you know, can they get inflation to within the target band that they're hoping for without dipping into a recession? Is it just going to be higher and longer until they eventually get there? And this is the new norm, as Dan said, or are we going to see them get more aggressive to drive this down? This is one of the major, major reasons the feds and the BOC have not cut rates. And in fact, we saw wage growth in Canada here last month too. To get wage growth to stall will require more corporate bankruptcies, more layoffs, further decline in GDP. This is something that we're not necessarily seeing down in the, down in the States. In Canada, it's a little bit different. I, I'm not convinced though that any government or central bank is really prepared to do that, especially in an election year. I believe some prices actually are, are not going to revert to where they were. So the best that maybe we could look for is a moderation at the rate in which prices are going up. There will be some stabilization in some key areas, perhaps in the grocery store, but overall, you're going to see consumers bothered by the current price environment, I think, for an extended period of time. And as unfortunate as it may be, it's my opinion that some higher prices are here to stay for good. Now let's shift into what's happening with the unemployment rate here in Canada, because the jobs report came out and it was considered a, a disappointing print in the sense that there were an expected 25,000 additional jobs, but ultimately it ended up at minus 2,000 in a month over month tracking basis. Uh, but what really and immediately stands out here 
is the 0.3% increase in that unemployment rate is the largest monthly jump we've seen since about the middle of 2022. And that puts it above 6% for the first time since 2017, if we set aside, of course, the pandemic surge. We are now nearly 90 basis points above the 12 month low. What does that mean? Well, when we look at the historical track record, 100% of the time, those metrics predict a recession. What's more, the employment rate has also fallen for about six straight months now. This is the longest consecutive streak dating back to 2009. It is down almost a full percentage point year over year. Again, a decline that is consistently pointed to a recession in the past. So it looks like the 1.3 million person population growth we've seen for the last couple of years is just straight up outpacing job growth. And what's more, there has been a sharp increase in the share of people who have been out of work for more than 27 weeks. That metric has risen from 14% to 18% in just the last nine months. This also is a clear sign that jobs are getting harder to find. So when we talk about having these increased rates for over two years now, it's taken that long for them to work their way through the system. We've definitely seen it in the delinquency and the foreclosure rates in companies and businesses. And what does that lead to? Of course, unemployment. And now that metric is starting to increase, right? This stuff takes time to work through the system. And now we are seeing it. So now, in one sense, is the time to pivot. But chances are they won't as of yet. Yeah, I really wonder if, if kind of like I mentioned in the last piece, if, if it's that, that rate of change, that acceleration and that rate of change is going to become far more pronounced in the latter half of the year here as these numbers continue <clears throat> to get stronger, well, or weaker, depending on how you look at it. Uh, speaking to... Uh, let's let's look at the population in detail here. Um, so non-PRs grew by another 150,000 in the last quarter. That is actually a sharp decline in the previous two quarters, where there were over 200 and 300,000 respectively. Still much higher than PRs, which grew by 91,000 last quarter. The population year over year is 1.27 million higher than it was the year before. That is an increase of 3.2% year over year. That is massive. Of that, 800,000 or 64% were not permanent residents. So the population growth of this rate looks to have peaked for the time being. I guess we'll see. But non-PRs in the country equate to 6.2% of the total population. The three-year target announced by the government is to reduce that now to 5% or 600,000 less non-permanent residents. That's equivalent to 548 less per people per day for the next three years. I think this is a, this is a good thing, uh, not because I'm against immigration, but because I think I'm for a, a process that would work. When you look at the physical infrastructure, the medical infrastructure, the educational infrastructure, it needs time to catch up. And the only way that we can do that, I mean, prices are a lot further down that road, but the only way we can do that is by slowing down the rate of people that are coming in. Hopefully, some of that population growth will include new teachers, new doctors, engineers, and other professionals that the country desperately needs on top of those that service the economy generally. We need this to help balance the problem that we find ourselves in today. Let's look over to Toronto now because it's always fascinating to compare the housing market in Toronto compared to here in Vancouver. Historically, we've seen them completely converge and now they have diverged again and we want to give you an update today. So what's it look like over there? Well, Toronto home sales are low. The lowest, in fact, dating back to 2009, and they're down about 5% from last year, especially within the condo segment, which is down 16% year over year in the 416 phone code area. But ultimately, there's no signs of a massive sell-off because when we look to the new listings, they're well below the long-term norms. And in March, they were down 17% year over year, a typically big listing month. Still, Total listings, active inventory, is up about 22% year over year, but it's up 50% for condos. Obviously, something is going on with that property type. To add to this, 
the next three years see a record number of condo completions in the Toronto area. Now, today, as an investor, if you were to buy the average condo at the average price and get average rents with an 80% loan to value with the average mortgage, you're still about $1,300 a month negative cash flow. So condos aren't exactly very attractive to investors. So Toronto may see this property type experience downward pressure on prices as fewer buyers combined with increasing inventory converge over the following years, supply and demand. Prices though, just like Vancouver, saw a second month of increases uh, after about six months of them lowering. Interestingly, in Toronto, the average home sold for 2% over the asking price, meaning most homes were, I guess, sold in a competing scenario. But let's look over as well at the pre-sale market because it is having some issues. New home sales or pre-sales were the lowest since the early 2000s, over a 20-year low. They hit around 800 units sold for the month of February. Compare that to the February in 2020, pre-pandemic, there were almost 5,000 units sold. Now, rental listings, well, guess what? They spiked about 70% year over year, and they're sitting at the highest amount in over a decade for the month of March. So understandably, supply and demand rental rates are dropping. They're down about 2% year over year in the Toronto area. Nationally, the rental rate dropped just 0.1% month over month, but again, is pulling itself down. With the feds here in Canada set on reducing that amount of non-permanent residents in our country, we should expect average rents to cool over about the next 18 months or so as we're seeing as much reduced population growth rate and all these uh, properties, condos, especially in the Ontario area coming to market. It's interesting because we, we talked about it in our last podcast, how uh, while Canada is in the midst of, of, a, of a downturn when it comes to housing, not all pain is felt equally uh, across the country or nor is it evenly distributed across the country. Because when you start to look at Calgary and Edmonton here, we've got a completely different story. In fact, you'd think it was maybe a different country. Home sales were up 9% year over year in Calgary and 35% in Edmonton, likely a city to experience significant growth and price appreciation in 2024. Calgary's sales to new listings ratio has surged to 93% last month. This is a red, red hot market. Compare that to uh, Toronto or Vancouver at just 40%. Calgary's ratio is largely due to an 18% drop in new listings year over year as well. This extreme low inventory is the reason for price increases and highlight, highlighting the provincial intro, sorry, and highlighting the interprovincial migration to these areas because of the high cost of living in places like Toronto and places like Vancouver. Inventory in Calgary is now running at a decade low and in Edmonton, it's a nine year low. Inventory levels are down 21% in Calgary year over year alone and down 16% in Edmonton. Calgary saw prices increase again last month, now up 11% year over year, hitting a new all time high of 575,000. Even at that all-time high, comparatively speaking to major markets like Vancouver or Toronto, that is very affordable by comparison's sake. Calgary's home prices are up 43% since 2020, and Edmonton is up 4.3% year over year. I mean, that is a crazy different story, a crazy different look uh, than, the, than what you just described, Dan. Price matters in that sense, you know, and it's so true, right? BC saw a record number of people leave this province last month and the vast majority went to Alberta and, and namely, of course, Calgary. So they could have a much more affordable uh, standard of life. Now, real quick here, we want to give just a micro update on what's happening in the Vancouver market. Uh, um, as of April the 10th, as of Wednesday, we've got data for, I believe it's seven days of sales and we've seen about 965 home sales and the month of April is on track for about 2,900 units so far. That's actually up from last year, around 6%. Uh, but the early metrics on prices are, are definitely taking a hit here. We see median and average off about 6% in the first uh, seven days of sales. We'll see where it washes out, of course. Though we are on a potentially positive sign seeing some inventory now. 
as of today, we're seeing almost 12,000 active listings on the market. If that were to wash out at that number uh, at the end of the month, it would be a three and a half year high in inventory. So there's starting to be some options for buyers out there and sellers are feeling more confident in the market, in the landscape, maybe due to two months of price appreciation that it's time to sell their home. Also, a more naturally busy spring here. Uh, ultimately, as we know, a lot of uh, properties are delisted at the end of the month, but we might finally see a number over 10,000 when the month is done, maybe 10,500 or so. But with all these things that are happening, you may be asking yourself, well, what the heck do I do? Do I buy? Do I sell? Do I hold? Do I leave the country? Well, we're here to help answer that question. So if you are interested in having a talk with us, let's just have uh, an open conversation and discuss what kind of options are in front of you. There's a Calendly link below. Just click on that and we'd be more than happy to chat about Vancouver real estate. Um, Ryan, any last words for this episode? I think much like we were talking about before, there's pain all across the country. It's just uh, unevenly distributed. If you're in Toronto, you're experiencing something. If you're in Vancouver, you're experiencing a different story, especially if you're in Alberta, you're seeing something completely different. That we're also seeing a change in immigration uh, and a change in tone, I think, from the US Fed. I think that could be a, I mean, our economies are so uniquely tied together that if they don't drop rates, uh, you, you know, we're going to continue to see more movement in, in the markets and, and potentially to the downside in the, in the near term. I think in the longer run, things will improve, uh, but you know, their central banks aren't going to uh, relent when it comes to inflation. And until they get what they want, uh, I, I think we're on this path and it's going to be turbulent for a little while. Fantastic. There it is. Thank you as always for tuning in and we look forward to bringing you more valuable Vancouver real estate information next week. Thanks and have a great day. Bye.